Chapter Thirty of John Thursday by Lewis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perrar. With scant delay, Joan began to pick up acquaintances. Nothing is easier in that milieu to which the girl dedicated herself. The process of widening her circle began with meeting the girl whom Joan had heard singing in the adjoining bedchamber they passed twice in the corridors of the astoria inn before joan had been resident there twenty-four hours and on the second occasion the girl with the voice nodded in a friendly way and inquired if joan didn't think the weather was simply awfully lovely today. joan replied in the affirmative and their acquaintance languished for as long as twelve hours then toward six in the evening the girl presented herself at joan's door in a condition of candid deshabille wishing to borrow a pair of curling irons being accommodated she came on into the room perched herself on the edge of the bed and made herself known her name was minnie hessian and she had been singing in the chorus for seven years originally a prettyish plump-bodied brunette she was at present what she herself termed black and tan in the middle of the process of letting her hair go back her father was chief of police of some western city name purposely withheld joan was however assured that she would be surprised if she knew what city and her folks had heaps of money and had been wild with her when she insisted on going on the stage but goodness dearie when you've got temperament what you going to do nobody outside of the business ever understands all the same much as the folks disapproved of her carving out a career for herself whenever she got hard up all she had to do was telegraph straight back home she was of course at present without employment but joan was advised to wait until arley arlington got back into town arley never forgot a girl who had not only a good voice but some figure if miss hessian did say it herself they went shopping together the following afternoon and in the evening dined together at a cheap italian restaurant counterpart of that to which quard had first introduced joan and the sisters dean joan paid the bill by no means a heavy one and before they went home stood treat for the movies after that their friendship ripened at a famous rate if exclusively at joan's expense before it had endured a week joan had loaned many ten dollars toward the end of its first fortnight she mortally offended the girl by refusing her an additional twenty and the next day minnie moved from the astoria inn without the formality of paying her bill or even of giving notice the management philosophically confiscated an empty suitcase which she had been too timorous to attempt to smuggle out of the house everything else in her room had mysteriously vanished and considered this incident closed in this the management demonstrated its wisdom in its day and generation it never saw miss hessian again nor did joan but through the chorus girl as well as independently joan had contracted many other fugitive friendships she never lacked society after that whether masculine or feminine men liked her for her good looks and unaffected high spirits women tolerated her for two reasons because she was always willing to pay not only her own way but another's and because she was what they considered a swell dresser her presence was an asset to whatever party she lent her countenance frankly reveling in freedom regained and intoxicated by possession of a considerable amount of money she let herself go for a time quite heedless of expense or consequence within a month she had become a familiar figure in such restaurants as burns churchill's and shanley's and her laughter was not infrequently heard in jack's when all other places of its class boasted closed doors and drawn blinds inevitably she acquired a somewhat extensive knowledge of drink most of all she learned to love that champagne which matthias had been too judicious to supply her and from which she had abstained out of consideration for quard's weakness 
but now there was no reason why she should not enjoy it in such moderation as was practised by her chosen associates she preferred certain swedish and heady brands whose correspondingly low cost rendered them more easy to obtain but with all this she never failed to practise a certain amount of circumspection in one respect she refrained from growing too confidential about herself that she had been the leading woman with the lie was something to brag about the very cards which she had been quick to have printed proclaimed the fact loudly in imitation old english engraving but that she had been wife to its star was something which she was not long in discovering wasn't generally known the success of the sketch was a byword of envy among actors facing the prospect of an idle summer and the rout columns of variety told her that in line with her prediction quard had somehow surmounted his san francisco predicament and was continuing to guide the little play upon its triumphal course but quard himself had always been too closely identified with stock companies of the second class to have many friends among those with whom his wife was now thrown actors for the most part of the so-called legitimate stage with scant knowledge or experience little at least that they would own to of theatrical conditions away from broadway and the leading theatres of a few principal cities so joan kept her own counsel about her matrimonial adventure its publication could do her no good if possibly no harm and she preferred the freedom of ostensible spinsterhood her wedding ring had long since disappeared from her hand giving place to the handsome diamond with which matthias had pledged her his faith furthermore such dissipation as she indulged in was never permitted to carry her beyond the border-line which in her understanding limited discretion in her relations with men she enjoyed leading them on but marriage had made her too completely cognizant of herself to permit of any affair going beyond a certain clearly defined point she couldn't afford to throw herself away and more than once she checked sharply and left an undrained glass warned by her throbbing pulses that she was responding a trace too ardently to the admiration in the eyes of some male companion of the evening but there were only two whom she held dangerous to her peace of mind one because she was afraid of him the other because she admired him against her will the first was an eccentric dancer and comedian calling himself billy salute a man of middle age and old beyond his years in viciousness the gymnastic violence of his calling in great measure counteracted the effects of his excesses and kept him young in body he was a constant and heavy but what was known to joan circle as a safe drinker drunkenness never obliterated his consciousness or disturbed his physical equilibrium in spite of its web of wrinkles his skin remained fair and clear as a boy's and retained much of the fresh colouring of youth but his eyes were cold and hard and profoundly informed with knowledge of womankind his regard affected joan as had marbridge's that day at tanglewood under its analysis she felt herself denuded pretense were futile to combat it the man knew her he made no advances but he watched her closely whenever they were together and she knew that he was only waiting patient in the conviction that he had only to wait and thus he affected her with such fear and fascination that she avoided him as much as possible but he was never far out of her thoughts he lingered always on the horizon of her consciousness like the seemingly immobile yet portentous bank of cloud that masks the fury of a summer storm the other man pursued her without ceasing he was young not over twenty-five or six an age to which joan felt herself immeasurably superior in the knowledge and practice of life and happened to be the one man of her acquaintance who was neither an actor nor connected with the business side of the stage by some accident he had blundered from newspaper reporting to writing for cheaply sensational magazines and from this to writing for the stage it is true that his achievements in this last quarter 
had thus far been confined to collaboration with a successful playwright on the dramatization of one of his stories but that didn't lessen his self-esteem and assertiveness he claimed extraordinary ability for himself in a quite matter-of-fact tone and on his own word was on terms of intimacy with every leading manager and star in the country nobody joan knew troubled to contradict his pretensions and despite that wide and seasoned view of life she believed herself to possess she was still inexperienced enough to credit more than half that he told her never appreciating that had the man been what he claimed he would have had no time to waste toadying to actors he might if not discouraged prove very useful to her in fact he promised to repeatedly more than this his attentions flattered her more than she would have cared to confess even to herself he didn't lack wit wasn't without intelligence and the power of his imagination couldn't be denied thus he figured to her as the only man of mental attainments she had known since matthias it was something to be desired by such as this one even though his abnormally developed egotism sometimes seemed appalling it manifested itself in more ways than one in his strut in the foppishness of his dress in his elaborate affectation of an english accent he was a small person by the average standard and slender but well formed and wore clothing admirably tailored if always of an extreme cut his cheeks were too fleshy almost plump something which had the effect of making his rather delicate features seem pinched near-sighted he wore customarily a horn-rimmed pince-nez from which a wide black ribbon dangled like a mourning band his name was hubert fowey so joan tolerated him encouraged him moderately through motives of self-interest checked him with laughter when he tried to make love to her secretly admired him even when his conceit was most fatiguing and wondered what manner of women he had known to make him think that she would ever yield to his insistence she had been nearly six weeks in new york when she awoke one morning to rest in languorous regret of a late supper the preceding night and to wonder whither she was tending spurred to self-examination by that singularly clear introspective vision which not infrequently follows intemperance at least when one is young she was reminded sharply that since returning to town she had made hardly a single attempt to find work beyond having her professional cards printed and this was the edge of summer where would the autumn find her slipping quickly out of bed she collected her store of money and counted it for the first time in several weeks the sum total showed a shocking discrepancy between cold fact and the small fortune she had all along been permitting herself to believe she possessed even allowing for these heavy initial purchases on returning to new york her capital had shrunk alarmingly she began anew that day the rounds of managers offices also she laid down for her guidance a rigid schedule of economies only by strict observance thereof would she be able to scrape through the summer without work or financial assistance from some quarter characteristically she mourned now but transiently that she had so long deferred going to see her mother and edna something now obviously out of the question they would want money to a certainty and joan had none to spare them a few days later she moved to share half and half the expenses of a three-room apartment on fiftieth street near eighth avenue with a minor actress whom she had recently met and taken a fancy to life was rather less expensive under this regime the young women got their own breakfasts and as a rule lunches that were quite as meagre repast chiefly composed of crackers cold meats from a convenient delicatessen shop but sometimes a bottle of beer shared between two if no one offered a dinner in exchange for their society they would dine frugally at the cheaper restaurants of the neighborhood but their admirers they shared loyally if one were invited to dine the other accompanied her as a matter of course an arrangement apparently conducive to the most complete intimacy 
neither party thereto doubted that she was in the full confidence of the other there were none the less reservations on both sides harriet morrison joan's latest companion was a girl whose very considerable personal attractions and innate love of pleasure were balanced by greenish eyes a firm jaw and the sincere conviction that straight going and hard work would lead her to success upon the legitimate stage she knew joan for an incurable opportunist with few convictions of any sort other than that she could act if given a chance and that men if properly managed would give her that chance for one so temperamentally her opposite hattie couldn't help entertaining some unspoken contempt on the other hand she believed joan to be decent as yet and having the cost of living permitted her to indulge in the luxury of a weekend at the seaside once or twice a month one day near the first of july the two happening to meet on broadway after a morning of fruitless search for engagements turned for luncheon into shanley's new restaurant by way of an unusual treat they had barely given their order when matthias came in accompanied by a manager who had offices in the bryant building and sat down at a table not altogether out of speaking distance to cover her discomfiture which betrayed itself in flushed cheeks joan complained of the heat an explanation accepted by hattie without question since matthias had not yet looked their way joan prayed that he might not but the thing was inevitable and it was no less inevitable that he should look at the precise instant when joan unable longer to curb her curiosity raised her eyes to his for a moment she fancied that he didn't recognize her but then his face brightened and he nodded and smiled coolly perhaps but civilly without the least evidence of confusion they might have been the most casual acquaintances and indeed the incident would probably have passed unremarked but for the promptings of joan's conscience she was sure the glance of matthias had shifted from her face to the hand on which his diamond shone and had rested there for a significant moment as a matter of fact nothing of the sort had happened matthias was absorbed in negotiations concerning an old play which had caught the fancy of the manager joan though he knew her at sight was now too inconsiderable a figure in his world for him to recall off-hand that he had ever made her a present nevertheless the girl coloured furiously and blushed again under the inquisitive stare of her companion who's that who joan muttered sullenly the fellow who bowed to you just now oh that joan made an unconvincing effort at speaking casually a man named matthias a playwright i believe oh said the other girl quietly never done anything much has he i don't know you don't know him very well there was a touch of irony in the question that struck sparks from joan's temper that's my business i beg your pardon hattie drawled exasperatingly and the incident was considered closed though it didn't pass without leaving its indelible effect upon their association with joan it had another result it made her think retrospectively examining the contretemps after she had gone to bed that night she arrived at the comforting conclusion that she had been a little fool to think that matthias held that old ring against her he hadn't been her lover for several weeks without furnishing the girl with a fairly clear revelation of his character he was simple-hearted and sincere she could not remember his utter one ungenerous word or being guilty of one ungenerous action and she didn't believe he could make room in his mind for an ungenerous thought now if she were to return it he would think that fine of her of course she must take it back in person if she returned it by registered mail he would have reason to believe her afraid to meet him that she had been frightened by his mere glance into sending it back not that she hadn't every right in the world to keep it if she liked there was no law compelling a girl to return her engagement ring when she broke with a man but matthias would admire her for it 
moreover it was just possible that he had not as yet arrived at the stage of complete indifference toward her and he had the ear of the managers nerving herself to the ordeal two days later she dressed with elaborate care in the suit she had worn on her flight from quard newly sponged and pressed it was quite presentable if a little heavy for the season moreover it lacked the lustre and style of her later acquisitions it wouldn't do to seem too prosperous it was a saturday afternoon and had he had taken herself off to a nearby ocean beach for the weekend something for which joan was grateful inasmuch as it enabled her to dress her part without exciting comment to her relief a servant new to the house since her time answered her ring at the bell of number two eighty nine and with an indifferent nod indicated the door to the back parlour behind that portal matthias was working furiously against time carpentering against the grain that play to discuss which he had lunched at shanley's the managerial personage having offered to consider it seriously if certain changes were made and the playwright was in haste to be quit of the job not only because he disapproved heartily of the stipulated alterations but further because he was booked for some weeks in maine as soon as the revision was finished humanly then he was little pleased to be warned through the medium of a knock that his work was to suffer interruption he swore mildly beneath his breath glanced suspiciously at the non-committal door growled brusque permission to enter and bent again over the manuscript refusing to look up until he had pursued a thread of thought to its conclusion and nodded that same all chip shape and when at length he consented to be aware of the young woman on his threshold waiting in a pose of patience her eyes wide with doubt and apprehensions his mind was so completely detached from any thought of joan that he failed at first to recognize her but the alien presence brought him to his feet quickly enough i beg your pardon he said with an uncertain nod you wish to see me about something closing the door joan came slowly forward into stronger light you don't remember me she asked half perplexed half wistful of aspect but i thought the other day at shanley's but of course i remember you matthias interrupted with a constrained smile but i wasn't uh, expecting you not exactly you understand oh yes joan replied in subdued and dubious accents i understand she waited a moment watching narrowly under cover of assumed embarrassment the signs of genuine astonishment which matthias felt too keenly to think of concealing then she added an uneasy of course of course matthias echoed witlessly you wanted to see me about something he iterated wandering with an effort he pulled himself together won't you sit down uh joan thank you said the girl but i'm afraid i'm in the way she amended dropping back into the old worn easy chair oh no i the insincerity of his disclaimer was manifest in an apologetic glance toward the manuscript and a hasty thrust of fingers up through his hair joan caught him up quickly oh but i know i am so i shan't stay she said settling herself comfortably i only ask a minute or two of your time you don't mind mind why i certainly not she looked down as if disconcerted by his honest perplexed questioning eyes i was afraid you might after after what's happened he fumbled for a cigarette beginning to feel more calm less nervous than annoyed the fact of her unruffled self-possession had at length penetrated his understanding no he said slowly rolling the cigarette between his palms i don't mind in the least if i can be of service to you but i was very foolish joan persisted and and unkind i've been sorry ever since don't be matthias begged his tone so odd that she looked up swiftly and coloured thus far everything had gone famously quite as rehearsed in the theatre of her optimistic fancy but the new accent in his voice 
made her suddenly fear lest after all the little scene might not play itself out as smoothly as it had promised to don't be matthias repeated coolly it's quite all right take my word for it as far as i'm concerned you've nothing at all to reproach yourself with her flush deepened you mean you didn't care matthias smiled but not unkindly i mean he said slowly neither of us really cared speak for yourself joan cut in with a flash of temper but he obtained her silence with a gentle gesture please i mean we both lost our heads for a time that was all there was to it i think naturally it couldn't last you were wise enough to see that first and ah did the only thing you decently could when you threw me over i understood that at once but i she began in a desperate effort to regain lost ground i was afraid you hate and despise me not a bit joan believe me not for an instant when i had had time to think it all out i was simply grateful i could never have learned to hate or despise you as you put it whatever happened but if you hadn't been so sensible and far-sighted the affair might have run on too far to be remedied in which case we both have been horribly unhappy this was so far from the attitude she had believed he would adopt that joan understood her cause to be worse than forlorn it was lost lost that is until it could be saved by her premeditated heroic measure fumbling in her bag she found his ring perhaps you're right she said with a little sigh anyhow it's like you to put it that way but what i really came for was to return this she offered the ring he looked startled from it to her face hesitated and took it oh thanks he said adding quite truthfully i'd forgotten about that and tossed it carelessly to his work table where rolling across the face of a manuscript it oscillated momentarily and settling to rest seemed to wink cynically at its late possessor joan blinked hastily in response there was a transient little mist before her eyes and momentarily her lips trembled with true emotion the scene was working out more painfully than she had ever in her direst misgivings dreamed it might deep in her heart she had all along nursed the hope that he would insist on her retaining the ring that would have been like the matthias of her memories but now he seemed to think that she ought to be glad thus to disburden her conscience and by just so much to modify her indebtedness to him struck by this thought joan gasped inwardly and examined with startled eyes the face of matthias it was her first reminder of the fact that he had left her one hundred and fifty unearned dollars she had forgotten all about that till this instant otherwise she would have hesitated longer about calling she wondered if he were thinking of the same thing but his face afforded no index to his thoughts he wasn't looking at her at all in fact but down in abstraction studying the faded pattern of the carpet at his feet she wondered if perhaps it would advance her interests to offer to return the money to pay it back bit by bit when she found work but wisely she refrained from acting on this suggestion i'm sorry i was so long about bringing it back she resumed with an artificial manner i was always meaning to you know and always kept putting it off you know how it is when you're on the road one never seems to have any time to oneself i quite understand matthias assured her gravely she grew sensitive to the fact that he was being patient with her but i really mustn't keep you from your work she said rising you you knew i was working didn't you i heard matthias evaded in a roundabout way that you were playing in vaudeville the girl nodded vigorously oh yes i was all over playing the lead in a sketch called the lie it was a regular knockout you ought to have seen how it got over it's still playing somewhere out west i guess you left it then matthias asked bored heartily wishing her out of the house 
she was aching to know if he had learned of her marriage but then she felt sure he couldn't possibly have heard about it still she wondered if he did know would it modify his attitude toward her in any way yes she resumed briskly to cover her momentary hesitation i left it the week we played frisco i had to the star and i couldn't seem to hit it off somehow you know how that is and yet you must have managed to agree with him pretty well from all i hear what did you hear did he really know then why matthias explained ingeniously you must have been with the sketch for several months by your own account you couldn't have been bickering all that time confidence returned oh that yes of course but i could see it coming a long ways ahead so i quit and came back to look for another engagement you she broke off stammering beg pardon matthias queried curiously joan flushed again you don't know of anything i could do just now i suppose he shook his head not at present i'm afraid if you should hear of anything it would be awful good of you to let me know depend on me i shall care of the dramatic mirror will always give me i shan't forget well she offered him her hand with a splendidly timid smile i suppose it's good-bye for good this time matthias accepted her hand shook it without a tremor and released it easily i've a notion it is joan he admitted she returned toward the door advanced a pace or two and paused they say arlington's going to make a lot of new productions next fall yes well i was wondering if you wouldn't mind putting in a good word for me i would be glad to but unfortunately i don't know mr arlington but you know mr marbridge and everybody says he's arlington's silent partner matthias looked as uncomfortable as he felt i am not sure that is true he said slowly and well to tell the truth marbridge and i aren't on the best of terms i am afraid i couldn't influence him in any way except perhaps to prejudice him oh joan said blankly it came to her in a flash that the two men might have quarrelled about her thanks to the obvious fascination she had exerted over marbridge that age-old day at tanglewood i suppose she ventured pensively i might go to see him mr marbridge myself i'm afraid i can't advise you this time the accent of finality was unmistakable joan bridled with resentment after all he'd no real call to be so uppish simply because she hadn't let him stand between her and her career you don't really think i ought to go and see him do you i wish you wouldn't ask me joan but i've got no one to advise me if you don't think it wise i wish you'd say so i thought perhaps it was a chance matthias shrugged excessively irritated by her persistence i can only say that i wouldn't advise any woman to look to marbridge for anything honourable he said reluctantly oh the girl said in a startled tone but i'm sorry you made me say that it's none of my affair please forget i said it but you make it so hard for me i he cried indignantly i make it hard for you well i come to you for advice friendly advice and you close in my face the only door i can see to any sort of work it's it's pretty hard i can act i know i can act i guess i proved that when i was with charlie mr quard the star of the law you know i couldn't have stuck as long as i did if i hadn't had talent but back here in new york all that doesn't seem to count here i've been going around for two months and all they offer me is a courts job with some road company but arlington he employs more girls than anybody in the business i know he'd give me a chance to show what i can do if i could only get to him and then you tell me not to try to get to him the only way i know abruptly joan ceased breathing heavily after that long and even to her 
unexpected speech but it had been well delivered she could feel that she clenched her hands at her sides in a gesture plagiarized from a soubrette star in one of her infrequent scenes of stage excitement and stood regarding matthias with wide accusing eyes his own were blank he was trying to account to himself for the fact that this girl seemed to have the knack of making him feel a heartless scoundrel even when his stand was morally impregnable even though it were unassailable here was this girl evidently convinced that he had not dealt squarely with her believing that he deliberately withheld out of pique perhaps aid in his power to offer her he passed a hand wearily across his eyes and turned back toward his work chair you'd better sit down he said quietly while i think this out without a word the girl returned to the armchair and perched herself gingerly upon the edge of it ready to rise and flee she seemed whenever it should pardonably suggest itself to matthias that the only right and reasonable thing for him to do was to rise up and murder her on his part sitting he rested elbows upon the litter of manuscript and held his head in his hands he was sorry now that he had yielded to the temptation to be plain-spoken about arlington and marbridge but she had driven him to it and she was an empty-headed little thing and ought really to be kept out of that galley on the other hand he was afraid that if he allowed himself to be persuaded to help her find a new engagement she would misunderstand his motives one way or another most probably the one he couldn't afford to have her run away with the notion that his affection for her had been merely hibernating he had not only himself he had venetia to think of now to her he had dedicated his life to a dumb quixotic passion some day she might need him some day it seemed certain she would need him she was presently to have a child and marbridge was going on from bad to worse things could not for ever endure as they were between those two and then she would be friendless a woman with a child fighting for the right to live in solitary decency but joan if she were headed that way toward the arlington wheel within the wheel of the stage even at risk of blame and misunderstanding matthias felt that he ought to do what could be done to set her back upon the right road it was too bad really and it was none of his business the girl had given herself to the theatre of her own volition after all or had she had the right of choice been accorded her or was it simply that she had been designed by nature especially for that business to which women of her calibre seemed so essential was she after all simply life stuff manufactured hastily and carelessly in an old worn mould because destined solely to be fed wholesale into the insatiable maw of the stage he shook his head in weary doubt and sighed probably he said fumbling with a pen and avoiding her eyes i presume you'd better come back in a day or two say tuesday that will give me time to look round and see what i can scare up for you or perhaps wednesday would be even better he dropped the pen and rose his manner inviting her to leave wednesday she repeated reluctantly getting up again at four if that's convenient yes indeed it is and thank you so much jack no no matthias expostulated wearily no i mean it she insisted you're awfully sweet not to be unkind to me believe me i could never be that then good afternoon good afternoon joan but as he moved to open the door his eyes were caught by the flash from a facet of the diamond and the thought came to him that its presence there assorted ill with his latest assurance to the girl catching it up he offered it to joan as she was about to go and this he said smiling don't forget it please automatically her hand moved out to take it but was stayed her eyes widened with true consternation and she gasped faintly 
you you don't mean it oh yes i do please take it i've really no use for it joan and well you and i know what professional life means he grinned awry i might be of service to you some day with a cry of gratitude that was half a sob but with no other acknowledgment the girl accepted the gift stumbled through the door in a daze and so from the house End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this liverbox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard so it seemed that all men were much alike joan knew but two types the man who lived by his brains and the man who lived by his wits but had no more hesitation in generalizing from these upon masculine society as a whole than a scientist has in constructing a thesis upon the habits of prehistoric mammalia from the skull of a pterodactyl and the thigh bone of an ichthyosaurus they were all much alike if you knew how to get round one kind you knew how to win over the other there was a merely negligible difference in the mode of attack you appealed to their sympathies or to their sentiments or their appetites and if these failed you appealed to their pride in their self-assumed role of the protectors it was no great trick once you had made yourself mistress of it by this route joan achieved the feat of looking down on matthias and that was not wholesome for the girl leaving her world destitute of a single human soul that commanded her respect she had needed only to stir up his jealousy of marbridge and his innate chivalry as if she didn't know what arlington's companies were like the facts were notorious nobody troubled to blink them arlington's employees least of all it wasn't their business to blink the facts a girl without following had as little chance of securing a place in one of his choruses as a girl without a pretty figure but of course a handsome girl with a good figure joan glanced in a shop window en passant but she saw nothing of the display of wares the plate glass made a darkling mirror for the passers-by joan could see that her refurbished travelling suit fitted her becomingly even though it was a trifle passe she hurried home and changed it and hurried forth again to keep an appointment with hubert fowey they dined at a pretentious hotel in an orange garden whose false moonlight and tinkling artificial fountain manufactured an alluring simulacrum of romantic night despite the incessant activities of a ragtime bitten orchestra and the inability of the ventilating system to infuse a hint of coolness into the heavy superheated air joan had little appetite the day had been too overpoweringly hot but she was very thirsty and fowey provided a brand of champagne less sweet and heady than she would have chosen and consequently more insinuative during the meal billy salute appeared at a table across the room and invisible to fowey whose back was toward it but still not far enough removed to prevent joan from recognizing that look in the dancer's eyes which she resented so angrily she didn't once look at the man but she never quite lost sight of him and was well aware that he was ridiculing fowey to his companion an actor by many an indication but a stranger to joan provoked she demonstrated her contempt of salute by flirting outrageously with fowey unconscious of her motive that aspiring little dramatic author lost his head to some extent now and again his voice trembled when he spoke to her and once he mumbled something about marriage but checked at discretion and let his words trail off inarticulately joan was not to be denied what did you say she demanded with her most distracting smile oh nothing of any importance muttered fowey his face reddening but you did say something i only caught part of it hubert i want to know it was the first time she had used his given name i i only wondered if you were married 
he stammered you talk so cursed little about yourself does it matter she parried surrender in her eyes he choked and gulped on his champagne but you're not are you he persisted what's that to you he hesitated and changed the subject fearful lest his tongue compromise him what shall we do now don't say a roof garden let's get out of this infernal smother i vote for a taxi ride to manhattan beach joan assented leaving they passed salute's table joan gave the dancer a distant and chilling greeting and swept haughtily past ignoring his offer to rise the insolent irony of his eyes was incredibly offensive to her they said i am waiting i am patient i make no effort i am inevitable she swore in her soul that she would prove them wrong in the taxicab fowey made some slighting reference to the dancer he's the devil joan declared with profound conviction but she wouldn't explain her reasons for so naming him when occasion offered in the more shadowed stretches of their course to the sea fowey attempted to kiss her but she would have none of him then fending him off by main strength and raillery and she was pleased with the discovery that she was stronger than he yet another evidence of the inferiority of man at the beach fowey ordered a claret cup joan demanded an ice and drank sparingly but when again in the motor-car homeward bound she was abruptly smitten with amazement to find herself in fowey's arms submitting to his kisses if not returning them for a time she remained so and let him talk to love to her it was pleasant to be wanted arrived at the little flat she had to prevent fowey's following her in again by main strength slamming the door in his face bolting the door she turned to a mirror to see what a fright she must have looked but it seemed a radiant vision that smiled back at her she thought hazily of hubert fowey that kid she murmured not altogether in contempt but almost compassionately it was a shame to tease him so not until the next day that dawned upon her consciousness amid the thunders of a splitting headache did she appreciate how far the affair had gone penitent she vowed reformation she wasn't going to let any man think he could make a fool of her much less that conceited little whippersnapper as it happened she didn't see the amateur dramatist again for some days he too had vowed reformation and on much the same moral grounds her appointment with matthias for wednesday at four joan failed to keep and since that was her own affair and since she had not left him her address matthias kept to himself the word that he had for her and in accordance with his original intention boarded the bar harbor express that same evening and forgot new york for upwards of ten weeks it had rained all day tuesday and wednesday was overcast but dry and by contrast with what had been cool dressing for her interview with matthias joan donned a summery gown of lawn liberally inset with lacework over her shoulders and bosom a frock for the country house or the seashore never for the broadway pavements none the less it was quite too pretty to be wasted on matthias alone she set out to keep her appointment with an hour to spare purposing to employ the interval by running at leisure the gauntlet of masculine admiration on broadway as far south as thirty-eighth street for this expedition she would have preferred company but hattie having looked her over announced that she couldn't dress up to joan's style didn't mean to try and didn't care to be used as a foil furthermore it was much more sensible to loaf round the flat in little or no clothing at all and read up on pinero from the astor theatre corner joan struck across broadway to the eastern sidewalk chiefly to avoid the throng of loungers in front of the bryant building it is good to be admired but joan had little taste for the form of admiration that becomes vocal at once intimately and publicly halfway down the new york theatre building block she turned abruptly and scuttled like a frightened quail into the lobby 
from the back of which turning she was able to see without being seen by quard brief as the term of their dissociation was in mere point of elapsed time joan had so completely divorced herself from her husband that she was actually beginning to forget him physically no less than mentally she was beginning to forget him an outcast from her life he no longer had any real existence in her world by some curious freak of sophistry she had even managed to persuade herself she was never to see him again thus it seemed the most staggering shock she had ever experienced to recognize the man's head and shoulders looming above the throng before the entrance to the moving picture show just south of the lobby to the new york theatre proper but quard hadn't seen her he was with companions a brace of vaudeville actors whom joan knew through him but while she waited for them to pass two other friends accosted the three directly before the lobby entrance and they paused to exchange greetings quard slapped both newcomers on their shoulders and kept his hand on the last he slapped bending forward and engaging their interest with some intimate bit of ribaldry he had been drinking joan saw that much at a glance not heavily but enough to render his good fellowship boisterous otherwise he looked well he was hardly to be identified with that sodden wreck which had been brought from the barbary coast back to the woman he had insulted and abused his color was good his poise assured he was wearing new clothing a loud shepherd's plaid effect which joan couldn't possibly have forgotten no one could possibly have forgotten it and he had acquired a dashing panama hat which at least looked genuine at that slight distance useless to have wasted pity on the man he had fallen but not far and he had fallen on his feet joan eyed him with fear despair and loathing had he come to render new york too small to contain them both she skulked in the farthest corner of the lobby in shadows not quite round the corner of the elevator shaft where she could just see and ran least risk of being seen and waited but the group on the sidewalk seemed to have settled down to a protracted session when quard had finished talking and the laughter had quieted down another fixed the attention of the group with a second anecdote of what nature joan could well surmise of course it was only a question of time before quard would propose a drink then she would be free to proceed to her appointment but through some oversight the suggestion remained temporarily in abeyance and joan was unlucky in that none of the policemen appeared who were assigned to the business of keeping actors moving in that neighbourhood after a minute or two quard shifted his position so that he could by simply lifting his eyes have looked directly into the lobby at this joan turned in desperation and entered the cage of an elevator which happened just then to be waiting with an open gate there were several theatrical enterprises with offices on one of the upper floors no reason why joan shouldn't wait in one of these until it would be safe to venture forth again there was arlington's for instance joan's was no strange figure there she had long since made several attempts to see arlington or one of his lieutenants but her professional cards borne in to them by a disillusioned office-boy had educed no other response than mr arlington says there's nothing doing just present but it was as good a place as any for joan's purpose and there could be no harm trying again the same world-weary boy received her card when she entered the suite of offices he considered it and joan as well dispassionately who you want to see he mumbled with patent effort joan's prettiest smile was apparently wasted upon the temperament of an anchorite mr arlington please the boy offered to return the card he ain't in that's what you always tell me he ain't never in very well said joan sweetly i'll wait the boy started to say something pointed hesitated regarded her with dull suspicion and suddenly inquired what you want to see him about a matter of private business ah drawled the boy with infinite disgust 
that's what they all say an embittered grimace shaped upon his soiled face listen he said almost affably if you'll think up a good one i'll fetch this into his secretary now could anything be fair in that i'll go you joan retorted falling in with his spirit tell him a friend of mr marbridge's wants to see him she esteemed this a rather brilliant bit of diplomacy and at the same time considered herself stupid not to have thought of it before but it failed to move the office boy his head signalled a negative have to do better than that he announced if i fell for every wren that claims she's an intimate friend of mr marbridge but i am a friend of his truly i am joan insisted warmly the boy rammed the hand into a trousers pocket betcha he began but reconsidered you never can tell about a skirt he reminded himself audibly but just to prove i'm a sport i'll go ya motioning joan through the door of the reception room he shambled off with an air of questioning his own sanity the reception room was perhaps thirty feet long by fifteen wide an interior room lighted and none too well by electricity ventilated when at all through the doorways of adjoining offices a row of cane-seated chairs was aligned against the inner wall in the middle of the floor stood a broad and substantial table of oak it was absolutely bare here and there a few unhappy lithographs yellowing life-size photographs of dead or otherwise extinguished stars and a framed playbill or two of arlington's earlier ventures decorated the dingy drab wall there was no floor covering of any description in this room herded some two-score people of the stage waiting hopefully for interviews that were as a rule granted to not more than one applicant in ten a heterogeneous assemblage owning a single characteristic in common whenever at the far end of the room the door opened leading to the offices of the management every head turned that way and every voice was hushed in reverence yet it was seldom that the door disclosed anything more unique than a second office boy even more dejected than the first who peering through would after examining the card in his hand for the name of the applicant painfully recite some stereotyped phrase worn smooth mr brown your party says to come back next week miss holman your party's went out and won't be back this afternoon miss emerson mr arlington says everything's full up just present call in again or more infrequently mr grayson is to step in please joan found a vacant chair she had no hope whatever of being admitted to the presence despite the unexpected condescension of the office boy marbridge's name might prove the open sesame but she doubted that vaguely it wouldn't be her if that happened the atmosphere was stifling with heat complicated by stale human breath and the reek of perfumery all stratified with layers of tobacco smoke which entered over the transoms of the communicating offices above the muted murmurings of the unemployed's apprehensive voices could be heard the brisk chattering of two or three typewriting machines and telephone bells rang incessantly near and far one taking up the tune as soon as another ended the throng of applicants shuffled their feet uneasily expectantly morosely joan was so uncomfortable and oppressed that she was tempted to rise and go without waiting for the discounted answer only dread of encountering quard restrained her the longer she delayed the slighter the chance of finding him still in front of the theatre her thoughts drifted into reverie dully coloured with misgivings she thought of charlie quard as a bird of ill omen whose appearance could presage nothing but suffering and disaster ignoring altogether the truth that through his good offices alone however tainted with self-interest she had been suffered to enter into the profession whose ranks she had elected to adorn with that other truth that she owed him for the clothing she wore the food she ate the very roof that sheltered her and meant never to repay the voice of the second office boy chanted her name twice before she heard it 
miss thursday miss joan thursday joan started to her feet yes the party ye ask for says please to set this way End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrari. Between gratification and misgivings, Joan followed her guide in a flutter of emotion. When intending nothing more than to provide an excuse for using the anteroom as a temporary refuge, she hadn't for an instant questioned her right to use Marbridge's name. But now that it had appeared, she was to gain thereby the boon of an audience with arlington she was torn by doubts after all her acquaintance with marbridge had been one of the most tenuous description true the man seemed attracted by her at the time but that was many months ago and only recently he had looked her fair in the face without knowing her she had really gained her advantage through false pretenses and when marbridge learned of this would he not resent it had she not through her presumption put herself in the way of defeating her own ends she brought up before a closed door in a state of nervousness not natural with her you're to wait a minute her guide advised she wasn't thankful he wasn't the guardian of the outer defences just at present she was in no fit mood to bandy persiflage successfully but she was uncomfortably conscious that this present boy eyed her curiously as he threw open the office door she entered and he closed it after her the room was untenanted but a haze of cigar smoke in the air indicated that it had been only recently vacated it was handsomely furnished carpeted and decorated the broad flat-topped desk in one corner boasted an elaborate display of ornate desk hardware in the middle of the blotting pad a sheaf of letters lay beneath a bronze paperweight of unique design all in all an office owning little in common with the generality of those to which joan had theretofore penetrated she sat herself down uneasily a door communicating with the adjoining office though a solid door of oak was an inch or so ajar through it penetrated sounds of masculine voices in conversation but nothing distinguishable five minutes passed then the conference in the next room broke up amid laughter the doorknob rattled and joan rose automatically marbridge entered for a moment in her surprise and consternation joan could only stare and stammer but obvious though her agitation was marbridge ignored it gracefully shutting the door tight he advanced with an outstretched hand and a smile there was no resisting with in short every normal evidence of friendly pleasure in their meeting well miss thursday he said gratification in his carefully modulated voice this is public spirited of you joan shook hands limply her face crimson beneath his pardonably admiring stare i thank you but really he went on smoothly i consider it mighty nice of you to come look me up fancy your remembering me do sit down we must have a chat fortunately you've caught me in an off hour retaining her hand coolly enough he introduced the girl to a capacious lounge chair beside the desk then settled himself behind it joan shook her wits together you're awfully kind i kind marbridge denied the implication with an indulgent smile my dear miss thursday if you get to know me well and i sincerely hope you will some day you'll find there's not a spark of human generosity in my system i think only of my own pleasure how can there be kindness to you in my seizing this chance to improve our acquaintance i declare i thought you'd forgotten me oh no joan protested really that's charming of you but tell me about yourself how long have you been back not long joan replied 
instinctively to the first stop question that marks every other similar meeting in the theatrical district of new york that is i mean a couple of months oh then you didn't stay with the lie you knew about that marbridge nodded briskly indeed i did pete gloucester told me all about you how splendidly you were doing at rehearsals and then one afternoon in chicago i saw the sketch build and dropped in at the theatre for the sole purpose of seeing you and if i hadn't had a train to catch i'd have come right round back to congratulate you fact you were wonderful you were more than wonderful you were downright adorable and no mistake under the tonic stimulus of his flattery joan recovered her self-possession with surprising readiness so swiftly that she almost forgot to cover the phenomenon with prolonged evidences of pretty confusion she looked down her color high and smiling traced with a gloved forefinger an invisible seam in her skirt and then looking up shyly she appraised marbridge with one quick shrewd masked glance her instinct had not misled her this man esteemed her at a high value it's awfully kind of you to say so she murmured demurely marbridge bent forward leaning on the desk his gaze ardent i only say what i think miss thursday i watched you act that afternoon and so far as i was concerned you were the whole sketch and made up my mind then and there you were a girl with a great big future oh but really mr marbridge give you my word i said to myself then and there here's a little woman worth watching and if ever i get a chance to lend her a helping hand and don't do it i'd better quit fussing with this theatrical game and that was the effect of seeing you play just once mind you i'm afraid you're a dreadful kidder mr marbridge his injured look was eloquent of the injustice that she did him you don't believe me very well miss thursday wait some day i'll surprise you he swung back in his chair smiling genially some one of these days you'll set your heart on something i have the say in and then you'll be able to judge of my sincerity if i dared believe you joan told him boldly i might put you to the test sooner than you think well and why not i'm ready but as joan would have gone on the desk telephone rang sharply and marbridge excusing himself with a mumbled apology turned to the instrument and lifted the receiver to his ear hello who oh send her in to see mr arlington oh he did eh well say i'm not in either yes gone for the day replacing the instrument he swung round again there's proof already he informed her cheerfully that was nella cardrow one of the biggest propositions on our list star of mrs mixer and i'm putting her off solely to show you how sincerely i'm interested in what you have to say to me he bent forward again confidentially now tell me what can i do for you give me a job joan informed him honestly that's all i want just now work a part in anything you have influence with then you have left the lie marbridge persisted incredulously joan nodded i had to i couldn't stand it any longer but without you why i don't know what they were thinking of to let you go i just couldn't get along with the star and that's all there was to it joan declared he was a boozer and well i had to quit and the sketch oh it went on all right i guess without you well that's hard to credit however marbridge leaned back and for a moment stared thoughtfully out of the window i really can't think of anything we've got open just now that's good enough to offer you please don't think of me that way mr marbridge joan pleaded earnestly more than half deceived i'm ready for anything 
to get a chance to show these people what i can do anything however small just so it gives me a show i don't care what marbridge preserved admirably his look of intent gravity let me think a moment he requested pursing his full lips joan watched him closely through that brief silence her mood one of curious texture compounded in almost equal parts of hope and doubt of wonder and misgivings of appreciation of her own courage and shrewdness and of admiration for marbridge he was by no means what she would have termed handsome but he was uncommonly individual a personality that left an ineffaceable impression of strength and masculinity and with this he had an air of being finished and complete as though he not only knew better than most how to take care of himself in all ways but slighted himself in none she thought his mode of dress striking combining distinction and taste to an extraordinary degree and when in his abstraction he pinched his chin gently between thumb and forefinger she was impressed with the discovery that a man's hand could be at once well manicured and muscular he turned back abruptly with a sparkle of enthusiasm in his bold and prominent eyes by george i think i have it yes she breathed excitedly he considered an instant longer shook his head and jumped up i must consult arlington first he declared i wouldn't care to commit him without his consent no don't get up just excuse me one minute i'll be right back and before she could protest had she entertained the faintest idea of doing anything of the sort he left the room by the same door which had admitted him immediately she was again aware of a rumble of voices in the next office but now it was even more indefinite and again she waited a full five minutes alone when marbridge rejoined her it was with an air apologetic and disappointed it's too bad he announced aggrieved but it seems arlington has really gone for the day i shan't see him before evening likely possibly not until tomorrow so i must ask you to trouble yourself to come back if you don't mind mind joan laughed rising oh i guess not well marbridge assured her i don't think you'll have any wasted time to regret but i can't promise anything until i'm sure arlington hasn't made other arrangements or until i've managed to put a crimp into him if he has but you mustn't do that hush marbridge paused to chuckle infectiously there's one trouble he amended more gravely and that is i haven't got any too much time i'm booked to sail for europe saturday and have got so many little things to attend to i'm running round in circles but don't you fret i've got this matter right next to my heart miss thursday and i'm going to put it through if it humanly can be done now let me think when i can ask you to call again any time that suits your convenience mr marbridge well it's a question i'd like mighty well to have you lunch with me before i go but the truth is i haven't got hardly a minute unengaged you just happened to catch me right to-day i wonder if you could call in friday say about half-past three of course i can but i don't want you to didn't i tell you hush marbridge interrupted mock impatient not another word remember what i told you about how i felt that day i saw you act out in chicago the time's coming when i'm going to be powerful glad you gave me this chance to give you a lift miss thursday and then he paused in the act of opening the door and took joan's hand subjecting it to a firm friendly pressure before continuing and then perhaps i'll be coming round and begging favors of you for an instant joan's eyes endured without a tremor the quick searching probe of the man's she nodded quietly saying in a grave voice i guess you won't have to beg very hard not for anything i could ever do for you mr marbridge his smile was as spontaneous and bright as a child's 
it's a bargain he declared spiritedly and you can bet your life i won't forget my end of it good afternoon miss thursday remember friday at three thirty end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of john thursday by lewis joseph vance this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. As one result of her interview with Marbridge, Joan returned to her quarters in a state of thoughtfulness which was responsible not only for her forgetting the appointment with Matthias and the risk she ran of encountering Quard at every corner but also for her unquestioning acceptance of hattie's absence from the flat in the face of her expressed determination not to go out that afternoon hattie however was nothing loath to explain her change of mind when she blew in cheerfully shortly before dinner-time hello she exclaimed tossing her hat one way and her parasol another did you miss me joan looked up blankly from the depths of her musing no she said dully why well you went off half peeved because i wouldn't go traipsing with you and then i went out after all oh i've forgotten joan admitted without much interest well i didn't mean to go out but billy emerson sent me a pip and i bet you can't guess who i've seen joan shook her head arlington arlington joan exclaimed well and why not nothing only i thought you weren't looking for anything in musical shows no more am i and it wasn't a musical show i went to see him about billy sent me a card of introduction with the tip and arlington saw me and well i guess it's just about settled i'm to understudy nella cardrow in mrs mixer arlington wouldn't promise but told me to come in saturday morning and the understanding is he'll have contracts ready to sign then i do believe my luck's turned at last but joan argued perplexed i don't understand of course it's fine to get the job and all that and i'm awfully glad for you hattie but you act as excited as if it was the title role you expected to play maybe i do hattie retorted that's what an understudy's for isn't it to play the star part in case of an emergency yes but anyhow i don't mind telling you that's what i'm looking forward to you mean you think mrs cardrow now don't you ask me any questions i can't tell you what i think it's a secret having made this statement hattie sat down on the edge of the bed lighted a cigarette vacillated one second and proceeded to divulge the secret you see i called around to thank billy emerson after my talk with arlington and he told me the whole story in confidence nobody's to know it yet so you mustn't breathe a word to anybody but the thing's all fixed and nella cardrow's never going to play mrs mixer before a broadway audience she couldn't play it anyhow it's just a plain boiled dub never did anything before she persuaded marbridge to put her on in this show it's his money that's behind it mostly arlington's too wise to risk much on an uncertain proposition like the cardrow marbridge just hides behind arlington what for well i guess he figures home would be none the happier if friend wife knew he was putting the bills for nella cardrow's show he and cardrow billy emerson says are just about as friendly as the law allows and that isn't all but joan persisted stupidly if that's the case i don't see what makes you think he'll throw her down to get you the part if they ever caught anybody on broadway as innocent as you pretend to be hattie commented with a scorn for grammar as deep as for joan's obtuseness they'd arrest him that's all who ever told you marbridge was the kind of a guy to stick to a woman forever not to say when she's losing money for him billy emerson saw the show when they put it on up in buffalo a while ago and he says the play's a wonder 
but cardrow can't even look the part much less act it he says if they ever let her loose on the stage of a broadway theatre well marbridge and arlington can just kiss their investment of fond farewell for reasons of his own marbridge isn't ready to break with cardrow yet but he knows he's got a big success on his hands in this mrs mixer with her out of it so they're going right ahead just as if she was to be the star but when the show opens it'll be little miss understudy who will do all the acting the actress tossed aside her cigarette and bent forward regarding joan with mock solicitude does it begin to penetrate dearie it sounds to me like a pretty mean trick to play on mrs cardrow joan suggested don't you worry about her she'll survive all right and anyhow when you've been as long in this game as i have you'll realize that the motto of the profession is everybody for himself and the devil take the hindermost i've waited seven years for this chance and i'm not going to let it get past me through any sentimental considerations not if i know myself and you do just the same thing in my place too i don't see what right you've got to say that then you don't know yourself as well as i know you hattie laughed but listen i oughtn't to have told you all this you won't say anything will you dear no i won't say anything nor did joan consider it necessary to repay confidence with confidence by confessing the fact of her coincidental interview with marbridge the reflection that they must have been in adjoining offices at much the same time in spite of marbridge's assertion that arlington was out counseled reticence even if envy hadn't served to impose silence upon joan and she was profoundly envious of hattie's good fortune why could it not have been her own instead if marbridge honestly esteemed her abilities one half as highly as he had pretended to why could he not have seen to it that joan thursday rather than hattie morrison was selected for mrs cardrow's understudy still the matter was not yet definitely settled hattie's contract remained a thing of the future and she might be congratulating herself prematurely struck by this reflection joan withdrew even more jealously into her reserve but she anticipated her appointment for friday afternoon with an impatience that lent each hour the length of three and when the time drew near prepared herself for it with such exacting attention to the minutiae of her toilet that a final survey in a cheval glass sent her forth radiant with consciousness that she had never looked more charming to her surprise and somewhat to her disappointment marbridge didn't receive her alone she was shown into arlington's office finding there marbridge in company with the great man himself entrenched behind his desk arlington didn't move when she entered and only when marbridge formally presented joan deigned to rise half out of his chair and extend to her across the mahogany barrier a hand almost effeminately white soft and bedizened with rings pleasure to meet you miss thursday i'm sure he drawled his clasp as languid as the glance with which he looked joan over and sank wearily back into his chair i've been hearing wonderful things about you ah from mr marbridge he's very kind said joan in her best manner not at all marbridge protested i've only been describing how splendid your work was in the lie but mr arlington is the original of the gentleman from missouri you've got to show him however i know you can so that's all right oh i hope so joan replied with becoming diffidence if i ever get a chance you'll get that never fear arlington observed dispassionately marbridge has fixed it all up for you it's a risk a pretty big risk to take with an actress of your uh, comparative inexperience but as a rule i find it advisable to give marbridge his head when he sets his heart on anything you're awfully good joan murmured don't think it arlington returned in a tone of remote amiability 
teetering in his chair i've nothing whatever to do with it beyond engaging you and being responsible for your salary it's all marbridge's doing he examined with a perplexed air his highly polished fingernails you're to have a small part in a new comedy we're putting on next september he announced and at the same time you will understudy the star nella cardro in mrs mixer your salary will be sixty a week unless through some accident you're called upon to play the title role regularly and accidents will happen in the best regulated theatrical enterprises in which case you'll draw one hundred a week for the first season there are some details which marbridge will explain to you and if you'll drop in any time monday and ask for mr grissom he will have your contracts ready and now if you'll excuse me i've an appointment consulting his watch he rose and moved round from behind his desk good day miss thursday he said with a shadow of a formal smile i shall see much of you no doubt when the rehearsals begin oh thank you thank you joan cried arlington disclaimed title to her gratitude with a weary gesture don't thank me please thank marbridge you won't be long then he added at the door i'll be with you in ten minutes right you are good afternoon miss ah uh, thursday alone with marbridge joan began impulsively to protest her thanks but on glancing up fell silent abashed by an expression that glowed in the man's eyes like a reflection of firelight she lowered demure lashes to cloak her confusion a smile about her lips at once sophisticated and timid a distractingly pretty woman fully conscious of her allure and of his attraction for her a vision of provoking promise marbridge drew a deep breath if you persist in looking like that he said in a voice that trembled between laughter and a sigh don't blame me if i forget myself and take you in my arms and kiss you there are limits to my endurance joan looked up smiling well she said with a little nervous laugh well what of it End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perori before joan left marbridge they had arrived at an understanding which was not less complete and satisfactory in that it was largely implicit without receiving any definite explanation of the circumstances complicating the production of mrs mixer joan carried away with her a tolerably clear notion thereof both confirming and supplementing the second-hand information of hattie morrison mrs cardrow owned a heavy interest in the play joan had gathered and there existed as well a contract between her and arlington which would have to be eliminated before it would be possible to go ahead and make the production with another actress in place of the erstwhile star some very delicate diplomatic manoeuvring was indicated interim joan was to be privately drilled by peter gloucester for some weeks prior to calling together the full company to rehearse for the september production gloucester was just then out of town but she would be advised when and where to meet him on his return marbridge was to be absent from new york until the middle of september or longer but he promised to be back a week or two before the opening performance there were other promises exchanged with her future thus schemed the girl was very well content who had attained by easy stages to one of mental development in which those primary moral distinctions upon which she had been reared were no longer perceptible or if perceptible had diminished to purely negligible stature it was not in nature for her to disdain or reject or bargain on moral grounds she knew or recognized none that applied for over a year during the most impressionable period of her life joan thursday had breathed the atmosphere of the stage 
she had become thoroughly accustomed to recognize without criticism those irregular unions and regular disunions that characterized the lives of her associates she had observed many an instance where the most steadfast and loyal love existed without bonds of any sort and as many where it existed in matrimony and as many again where neither party to a marriage made aught but the barest pretence of fidelity she had remarked that material and artistic success seemed to depend upon neither the observance nor the disregard of sexual morality she knew of husbands and wives against whom scandal uttered no whisper and whose talents were considerable but who had struggled for years and would struggle until the end without winning substantial recognition and she knew of the reverse the one unpardonable sin in her world was the sin of drunkenness and even it was venial except when it held the curtain or prevented its rising altogether as far as concerned her attitude toward herself she considered joan thursday above reproach seeing that she had withdrawn from her marriage long before even as much as contemplating any man other than her husband she held that she was now free at liberty to do as she liked untrammelled by opinion whether public or private that she had outgrown criticism true quard might divorce her but what of that if he did joan thursday wouldn't suffer if he didn't he himself would be the last to pretend he was leading a life of celibacy because of her defection marbridge she really liked his appeal to her nature was stronger than that of any man she had as yet encountered he attracted her in every way and he excited her curiosity as well he was a new type but in what respect different from other men he was famously successful with women why he had wealth cultivation of a certain sort real or spurious joan couldn't discriminate and social position and this flattered that such an one should reject the women of his own sphere for joan thursday late of a stock encounter and if she could turn this infatuation of his to material profit while at the same time satisfying the several appetites marbridge excited in her why not other women by the score did as much without censure or obvious cause for regret why not she how many women of her acquaintance women whose interests running in grooves parallel to hers were intelligible to joan would have refused the chance that was now hers through marbridge not one none at least who was free as joan was free not even hattie morrison whose views upon the subject of such arrangements were strong whom joan considered straight-laced to the verge of absurdity hattie joan believed would have jumped at the opportunity but of course denied hattie would be sure to decry it and with the more bitterness since joan had won it in the wreck of hattie's hopes and here was the only shadow upon the fair prospect of joan's contentment she who had questioned hattie's right to become a party to the conspiracy against mrs cardrow how could she ever go home and face the girl with this treachery on her conscience true hattie didn't know wouldn't know before morning might never learn the truth during the term of their association none the less to be with hattie that night would be to sit with a skeleton at the feast of her felicity on impulse joan turned to the left on leaving the new york theatre building and moved slowly purposelessly down broadway it was an afternoon of withering heat the pavements burning palpably through the paper-thin soles of her pretty slippers and the air close with the smell of hot asphaltum the rays of the westering sun made nothing of the fabric of joan's white parasol their heat penetrating its sheer shield as though it were glass mankind in general sought the shadowed side of the street and moved only reluctantly with its coat over its arm a handkerchief tucked in between neck and collar effectively choking off ventilation and threatening sunstroke 
waiting upon the northeast corner of forty second street for the traffic police to check the cross town tide joan felt half suffocated and thought longingly of the seashore once across the street she turned directly in beneath the permanent awning of the knickerbocker hotel and entered the lobby making her way round past the entrance to the bar to the recess dedicated to the public telephone booths a semi-exhausted and apathetic operator looked up reluctantly as joan approached with one glance appraising her from head to heels at any other time the dainty perfection of joan's toilet would have roused antagonism in the woman to-day she found energy only sufficient for a perfunctory mumble what number please joan hesitated feeling herself suddenly upon the verge of dangerous indiscretion but stung by the operator's look of jaded disdain took her courage in hand and pursued her original intention one bryant she said the operator jammed a plug into one of the rows of sockets before her and iterated the number mechanically in another moment she nodded indicating the rank of booths number five one bryant she said joan shut herself in with a sliding door and took up the receiver hello lamb's club she inquired is mr fowey in the club will you page him please miss thursday yes i'll hold the wire the booth was hermetically sealed perspiration was starting out all over her body and somewhere in that airless box probably at her feet lurked a long unburied cigar she thrust the door ajar but only to close it immediately as fowey's voice saluted her hello hello hubert joan drawled with a little touch of laughing mockery in her accents is that you joan really the voice demanded excitedly really she affirmed what are you doing there shut up all alone by yourself in that stupid club hubert prefaced by a brief but intelligible pause the man's response came briskly where are you now anyway that doesn't matter she retorted she had meant to ask him to meet her at the hotel but reconsidered fearing lest marbridge might chance to see them what really matters is that this is my birthday and i'm going to give a party have you got anything better to do no then meet me in half an hour on the southbound platform of the sixth avenue l at battery place battery place what in thunder never mind tell you all about it when we meet will you come will i well rather half an hour then i'll be there with bells on then good-bye for a little hubert good-bye fowler reached the point of assignation only one train later than joan as he hurried down the platform almost stumbling in his impatience to join her the girl surveyed with sudden dislike and regret his slight dandified figure fitted with finical precision into clothing so ultra english in fashion that it might have belonged to his younger brother and the confident smile that lighted up his pinched eager countenance seemed little short of offensive she was sorry now that she had yielded to the temptation to make use of him he was so insignificant in every way so violently the opposite in all things of the man who now filled all her thoughts marbridge and so transparent that even she could read his mind he entertained not the least tangible doubt that now after the manner in which they had last parted she had at length wakened to appreciation of his irresistible charms that her requesting him to meet her was but the preface to surrender but she permitted nothing of her thoughts to become legible in her manner after all she had only wanted an escort for the evening an excuse to postpone that unavoidable return to the company of the girl she had betrayed and fowey had seemed the most convenient and the least dangerous man she could think of if in the inflation of his insufferable conceit he dreamed for an instant another thing well joan promised herself he'd soon find out his mistake keeping up the fiction of her imaginary birthday she outlined her plans they would take one of the iron steamboat company's boats 
from pier one north river a short walk from the station to coney island when that resort palled they would drive to manhattan beach and dine perhaps take in paint fireworks and return to new york by the same route fowey's objections were instant and sincere and well grounded the boats would be crowded beyond endurance with an unwashed rabble liberally sung with drunks and screaming children if she would only let him he'd get a taxicab or even a touring car quietly but firmly joan overruled him it must be her party or no party as she proposed or not at all he yielded in the end but the event proved him right in all he had foretold joan was very soon made sorry she hadn't suffered herself to be gainsaid they had half an hour to wait for the boat and the waiting-room upon the second story of the pier was like an oven packed with a milling sweating mob exactly fulfilling fowey's prediction they were elbowed shouldered walked upon and at one time openly ridiculed by a gang of hooligans any one of whom would have made short work of fowey had he dared show any resentment upon the boat when at length it turned up tardily to receive them conditions were little better save that the open air was an indescribable relief after the reeking atmosphere of the pier fowey managed to secure two uncomfortable folding stools upon which they perched crowded against the rail of the upper deck a wretched orchestra wrung infamous parodies of popular songs from several tortured instruments children scuffled and howled burly ruffians in unclean aprons thrust themselves bodily through the throng balancing dripping trays laden with glasses of lukewarm beer and soft drinks and bawling in every ear their seductive refrain here's the waiter want the waiter who wants the waiter and an alcoholic planting his chair next to jones promptly went to sleep snoring atrociously and threatened every instant to topple over and rest his head in her lap a single circumstance modified in a way jones regret that she hadn't heeded fowey's protests as the boat swung away from the pier a larger steamship of one of the coastwest lines outward bound from its dock farther up the north river passed with leeway so scant that the dress and features of those upon its decks were clearly to be discerned and at the moment when the two vessels were nearest joan discovered one who stood just outside an open cabin door leaning upon the rail with an impressively nonchalant pose and smoking a heavy cigar he wore clothing of a conspicuous shepherd's plaid and his pose was an arrested dramatic gesture in a moment a woman emerged from the open door behind him and joined him at the rail placing an intimate hand on his forearm and saying something which won from him a laugh and a look of tender admiration a handsome able-bodied woman expensively but loudly dressed her connection with the stage as unquestionable as was his joan dissembled the odd emotion with which she recognized the man and turned to fowey what boat is that do you know hubert fowey raked her with an indifferent glance fore and aft belongs to the new bedford line he announced can't make out her name connects at new bedford for the boats to martha's vineyard and nantucket ever been up that way no what's it like pretty islands don't know martha's vineyard very well but nantucket's my old stamping ground go up there in the middle of the summer about now and you'll find every actor and actress you ever heard of and then some great place wish we were going there don't be silly the boats were drawing apart joan looked back for the last sight she was ever to have of her husband though she couldn't have known this she sighed a little in strange depression perplexed she tried vainly to analyze her emotion was it regret or jealousy of a sudden in the heart of that immense crowd with fowey attentive at her elbow she was conscious of a feeling of intense loneliness End of chapter thirty four